In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's graduation season, you may have noticed. Brought me back to, seems like an impossibly short time, and then yes, a long time, nine years ago, when my youngest child graduated from high school, the one who's about to turn 28, she, bought, she graduated from the Barstow School nine years ago, and I was honored uh, to be uh, the baccalaureate speaker for her graduation. It's one of the few times when I wrote a sermon that I wrote it out every word, word for word. And the reason I did that was even though her class was small, about 45 people, it was extraordinarily diverse, at least according to my experience in life. Almost every major religion of the world was represented either in her class or in the faculty at the school. They had Muslims, they had Jews, they had Christians of all sorts, they had Hindus, they had Buddhists, they had, I mean, it was just about all of them. So I wanted to make sure when I preached to such a diverse group that I didn't inadvertently offend anyone. That wasn't my intention. And so I wrote it out just to make sure. But it was a far cry from my high school. My high school graduation, which way back in 1972, my high school in New Mexico was more than 10 times bigger. The class was more than 10 times bigger than my daughter's almost 500 members in my class, and yet it was 100% Christian theoretically. We had no Jews, no Muslims, no any other minority. We had ethnic minorities, but we everyone was pretty much Christian, and that was the world I grew up in, where that was what we expected. It's what we saw. But that world, of course, is not here anymore, over the last 50 years, the world has gotten smaller and smaller. Travel has become much more easily. The populations have been mixing. And we have now, throughout the world, a, a, the issue of religious pluralism, where we find all kinds of people of different religions or no religion at all, all around us. And when I was growing up and people were looking at these trends and they were saying, oh, the world is going to be such a wonderful place when this happens. We're all going to learn about each other and we're going to learn how to get along and all the wars and terrible things are going to stop. And that didn't happen. Just yesterday as I was driving up here for the Daughters of the King uh, meeting we had on NPR, one of the commentators said was talking about that same thing we thought we would grow more to tolerant but instead we grew more tribal we become much more ready to wall people off and try to defend what is left of one particular cultural or religious understanding come on in so the question then becomes how do we respond, how do we live as faithful followers of Jesus Christ in this religiously pluralistic world where it's not particularly easy and where it becomes, in fact, the tendency of late has been not to be uh, understanding and tolerant, but rather restrictive and exclusive. So let's talk, how do we do this? Well, here's some ways not to do it. It's not a good idea to say, we have the right answers, you have the wrong answers, you listen to us. That one doesn't seem to work very well. Another one that doesn't seem to work very well is the, uh, the claim of persecution. Oh, we're being persecuted because we're no longer the dominant cultural and religious thing. It, you know, and this is brought out, for example, in the annual war on Christmas. You know, it's terrible. We can't say Merry Christmas anymore. Of course we can. Um, but because someone says Happy Holidays, does that, uh, does that somehow put some kind of a burden on us? 
But that's, it gives us, it's that sense of what used to be taken for granted has been taken away, and I don't like it. And of course, on the other hand, another response that doesn't work is, it doesn't matter. Because actually, what we believe in our faith does matter. If it didn't matter, we shouldn't bother to be here today. It does matter. It matters tremendously. How then? How then do we go about it? So just interestingly, brain science has shown some sides of what the dynamic is that's going on that we're dealing with. That when we deal with a, a situation that involves some kind of risk, different parts of our brain can respond depending on our emotional state. So if we're not anxious, but outward looking and somewhat relaxed when, when, we, when we encounter a risk, the part of the brain that tends to fire up is the part that deals with emotions and, and relationship. But when we're under stress and when we are fearful, the part of the brain that fires up is the amygdala, sometimes called the reptilian brain, the part that is fight or flight. And under the amygdala, we tend to go into black and white thinking. We tend to think us versus them. It's either run away or stand up and fight. And those responses don't tend to work well. But this is something that, despite the fact that now we have brain science to support it, was understood in Jesus' time. Because in the reading, in that middle reading today, when Jesus, when, when Peter is talking about how we respond, he says, do not fear anything they do. And that's so important because if we respond in fear, from fear, what we're going to get is fight or flight, us versus them. But in, in the gospel reading we're in, we're in the middle of, a, of this last, Jesus' last discourse, when he's talking about, he's prefaced what we said, he says, if you love me, then keep my commandments. What was his commandment? His commandment was, love one another as I have loved you. That was what it was all about. If we live in love, if love dominates who we are, then we respond with the emotional relationship part of our brain that says, how can we work this out together? How can we become, how can we hold our bonds even in the face of difference? So this is very important. So what would it look like to do that? Peter writes in today that he says, never be afraid to, to express the hope that is in you. He says, but do it with gentleness and reverence. Gentleness and reverence. That is, reverence of respect for the other person and for the situation and gentleness, not coming out and bludgeoning the other side, but considering them and considering what they would want. What might that look like? Our first reading today is an outstanding example of exactly what that looks like. When St. Paul addressed the people at the Areopagus in Athens, this is one that is particularly, um, I feel a real, I've always felt an affinity for St. Paul, and I had the opportunity uh, some years ago when our children were smaller we were touring Athens I went there it was one of those typical phasal days of walking your feet off we got up in the morning and we we went, walked all the way across Athens and up the mountains on one side where there was an old monastery and looked, went through that then walked all the way down all the way back across Athens and up the Acropolis to the Parthenon and toward that and then as we came down from the Acropolis we came to the Areopagus. Now I had always pictured the Areopagus when I'd read this account in Acts before as the central marketplace or something but in fact what it is is an outcropping of rocks just a bunch of rocks on the side of a hill. 
but it was the place, it was essentially a first century chat room is what it was. This is where the philosophers hung out and discussed anything. And if you read in Acts, it's what he says, it's people who gather and talk endlessly about anything that happens to be new. It's a chat room. St. Paul was invited to come and talk about what he was doing. And we hear his address today. And we started off very gently and reverently. He didn't say, you guys don't know anything. You've messed it up. You, let me straighten you out. He said, I've been, you're a very religious place. I've been walking around and looking at all your religious artifacts and shrines. You people are really devoted to the divine. And I, then I found this one shrine that was, quote, to an unknown god. I'll tell you who this unknown god really is. Now, you see, what he's done is he's been respectful of their own religion and culture, of who they are, and he's, at, he's tried to make connections between what he is going dis to discuss about God and Jesus to what they already know. Make the connection gently and to say, the God who created heaven and earth is not a deity like an image that lives in shrines, but is the father of us all. And now he's been revealed to us in this man, Jesus Christ, who he has raised from the dead. So now he's making this new argument. Like I said, he's not saying it doesn't matter. It matters tremendously. But he has established a relationship with them. He has, he has acknowledged that what they've done before has merit. And now they can talk about what's really important. This is a model we can all follow in our lives. We are going to continually be meeting people who see the world a different way from what we do. And if we go to the internet version, it is, hey, you're stupid, let me tell you what's right. Or we can go to God's version and respect that person, that person's experience, that person's culture, their per person's worldview, and look for connections. And in making connections, that is becoming related, establishing a relationship one to another, we can then begin to talk about what is truly important and how our faith animates us and what it has to offer to them. This, I believe, is the path that has been in front of us all these thousands of years. But it's still the only real path to learn to live in peace. The one that Jesus gave to us, the one that the church has been following, that's still the path with gentleness and reverence to proclaim the word of God to all the world. Amen.